chapter 24 as we continue our series, which is called A Clear Conscience Toward God and Man. We'll be moving to some other passages to draw out the depths of conscience that we want to consider. We'll be looking uh, <clears throat> at Romans chapter 14. We will be considering the issues of stumbling blocks sooner or later. We'll be considering Romans 13, our consciences and the state. We'll be looking at various secondary, though important, issues and how we deal with a conscience, first of all, <clears throat> with someone who disagrees with us. And we'll be considering matters like dealing with our conscience when it condemns us and we're unclear as to why. So there are a number of things we want to consider. That'll take a little while, but we'll look at these matters because they're a vital part of the Christian life. I believe without any hesitation, as far as my experience goes, <clears throat> I've not heard nearly enough teaching on the matter of conscience. And that has proven, I see now, to be a matter of uh, great injury to my own walk. And uh, I pray that we will be able to work through matters that each of you face on some regular basis. Sometimes things that you don't even realize are actually matters of conscience, <clears throat> including times when we reprove one another. <clears throat> Is your conscience clear enough, and do you know the Word of God well enough to correct your brothers and sisters? <clears throat> There's times when we should be quiet instead of speaking up, and there are times that we should be speaking up rather than being quiet. Those matters are almost always tied either to conscience or obedience, disobedience. So those things have to be considered and sorted out in our thinking. And I trust that we will do that as we move through this series of messages. So we are in Acts 24, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read <clears throat> through verse 16 again, but 16 is our focal point. Uh, it will be the springboard. It has been the springboard from which we have leapt into this particular subject. After having done the exposition of the passage, we are now unfolding the doctrine that has its roots in verse 16. That being said, let's stand together. <clears throat> we'll read verses 1 through 16, Acts 24. We have the privilege, we have the honor of having God's word. Let's give our attention to it. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness and that, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took, 
and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee. By examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but Twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his good word. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. <clears throat> we stand before the almighty God. Thou knowest us. Thou knowest every word in our tongue before we speak it. Thou knowest our attitudes even before our facial expressions and words and body language express them. Thou knowest, Almighty God, the things we will do in a day before we have conceived them. Thou knowest us. There is no secret with Thee. We praise Thee for Thy piercing and penetrating gaze upon us here this morning. Thou dost see us as we are, not as we try to present ourselves to one another. O oh God in heaven, make us honest people. O oh God in heaven, burn out all lip religion, all mouth religion. Father, help us to drop all facades. We stand open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, oh God, may we be earnest in our desire to hear thee this morning. O oh, thou that sittest in the glory, in the regions of eternity. O oh, where the citizens of heaven, saints, angels, all lift up their voices in praise and adoration to Thee. May our hearts soar to that place and magnify Thee with them. May our little voices, may our little presence here be united to those and throughout the world, throughout this day. May our hearts bring Thee that well-justified, that well-deserved praise, love, adoration, Honor, glory, riches, power, strength. Thou art God. There is none else. And O oh, righteous Lord, Thou knowest now there are lost ones here. Lost ones. They do not understand the concept of eternity doesn't affect them at all. They don't believe that they could be in such a place as hell for such a time as eternity. Oh, God, help them. Oh, this very day, draw near to them. Open their hearts, woo them. 
unto thee. Show them their need. Show them that Christ, the living Christ, the prophet, the priest, and the king is willing to save. Willing to save. God, make it, make it real in their hearts. Shake them up. Do whatever thou needest to do. But awaken them to the realities of eternity in heaven or in hell. Oh God, I pray for those saints that are sleeping. Wake them up. Wake them up. We're a day closer to the return of our God, our Christ, our blessed Lord. We are a day closer to the day of judgment where the sheep and the goats will be gathered and the sheep will be received into the beauty and glory of heaven with Christ. And those that are lost, the goats, will hear those dreadful words, Depart from me, I never knew thee. Oh God, this day is thy day. May we exalt thee in it, and may thy power be known in our midst. Now help this feeble vessel of dust to speak thy holy words, thy, thy spirit-breathed words, thy wonderful words of life. Oh, may thy people feed upon what thou dost say today. Help me not to blur. Help me not to obscure thy blessed words with mine. Oh, God, help us. And I ask it all that thou wouldst be exalted and that we might be edified. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the Word of God, personal experience, and the history of mankind testify with one voice every person has a conscience. Every person has a conscience. The Puritan Nathaniel Vincent said, quote, This thing called conscience is in everyone. There is no man without it. You may as well suppose a man without an understanding as without a conscience. And without a power to know anything as without a power to reflect on, on himself. Every reasonable soul being capable both of sin and grace is endued with a power of reflecting upon itself that sin may be condemned and grace may be approved. All are called upon to consider their ways, but to take our own ways into consideration is the work of conscience. Conscience, therefore, is in all. Conscience is not to be escaped. We can no more flee from conscience than we can run away from ourselves. Close quote. So, in our last message, <clears throat> we took up this vital subject once again. We asked a question. What does the Bible teach us about the conscience? To answer that question, we began a survey of the Old and New Covenant Scriptures. I want to remind everybody, I don't normally do this. I don't normally run through this many passages of Scripture. It is, I confess, like drinking from the fire hydrant. But there is a reason for my doing so. <clears throat> because this is such a neglected, ignored, maybe even rejected subject. I want God's people to see in God's word, by the power of God's spirit, how important God makes the conscience. So that is my reasoning 
if you have wondered. <clears throat> Before we began our survey, we established a fundamental point that is essential to any healthy Christian life. Let me say this again. You need to hear this. Not only do you need to hear this, you need to believe this with all your heart. We establish this fundamental point that is essential for a healthy Christian life. God alone is the Lord of the conscience. God alone is the Lord of the conscience. As we have seen, this is the testimony of Scripture. And if you truly take that in, let that sink in, it will change the way you do many things. It will certainly change your interaction with other people that call themselves Christians. It will change the way you do certain things in your home. God alone is the Lord of conscience. Not you. Not me. And it is vital that we get that. That will rule, if I can put it that way, everything else that we consider about the conscience. Whether you believe it or not, there is an impulse, a force, a power within you that wants to govern everybody else's conscience. And you're kidding yourself if you think that's not so. Our survey then unfolded in two parts. First, the Old Testament witnesses to the reality and activity of conscience, though it does not use the word. And secondly, the New Testament witnesses to conscience clearly and regularly, 32 times in the authorized version. So we made it as far as 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. And we will take up in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 this morning. I have left those passages that we covered uh, grayed out in your outline because some of you have not been here. Uh, I, I wanted to leave all of those references in so that you will take them and study them. Study every one of them. Think about God talking to you about your conscience and hear what the word says. If you don't, you are cutting the juggler of your Christian life. <clears throat> now, our message is entitled, The Nature of Conscience. May our loving Heavenly Father, who made us in his image and gave us a conscience, grant us the ability to understand, believe, and apply the scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit that we may earnestly love and obey Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and your conscience is all wrapped up in that. So is mine. So we resume. Under the heading, what does the Bible teach about the conscience? At 2 Corinthians 5, 11. <clears throat> That passage says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Because Paul and Timothy understood the fear of the Lord, they persuaded their hearers, hearers such as the Corinthians. So, since Paul and Timothy knew that God approved them, 
Paul hopes that the Corinthians consciences will approve them as well. Understand what he's doing? I know what God thinks about me. I know that he approves my preaching and my ministry among you. But there are some problems here. <clears throat> uh, there are people that are saying, oh, Paul's not really an apostle. And there are people that are rejecting some of the things I've taught them. There are problems there. <clears throat> he says, so I want you to think about my ministry among you. And then I want your conscience to judge what you've seen. Now, any minister of the gospel should be able to think in those terms. Don't just listen to what I'm saying. Watch my life. Why? Because your life needs to look like the scriptures of Almighty God. <clears throat> so, Paul wants the Corinthians to remember the character of Paul and Timothy's gospel ministry to them. Then he wants their consciences to approve them. Well, that's a bold thing to do. But that's coming from a conscience approved of God. So the conscience determines what is good or bad, true or false, and approves or disapproves something or someone. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, Paul writes to Timothy, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. And of faith unfeigned. Paul charged Timothy to command false teachers at Ephesus to teach nothing but the apostolic doctrine. Paul's reason for that command to Timothy is threefold. The apostolic doctrine produces love from a pure heart. A good conscience, and true faith. Apostolic doctrine, this is central. Apostolic doctrine is essential to a good conscience. And therefore to Christian living. That is another reason that there are catechisms and confessions. Generally, most Christians cannot absorb, cannot detect the structure of doctrine that unfolds in the Word of God. They very often don't go looking for that. <clears throat> so this was one of the reasons confessions and catechisms were regularly used for God's people. And they should be today. Most people could not tell you. More than three or four or five doctrines, maybe, that are in the scriptures. You need to know the apostolic catalog, at least to the best of your ability. Why? Because it is the structure of eternal truth. Your conscience will never function properly without God's truth. Paul wasn't just saying justification by faith. That's vital. That's essential. You've got to know that. You've got to believe that. <clears throat> but he was talking about what he taught and in the sense of what Christ commissioned, everything Christ taught. That's a good time for us to ask, how am I doing with that? How am I doing with that? Am I coming to the word to inform my conscience so that when I look at my spouse, my children, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, lost people, my conscience is functioning right toward them? Does my conscience approve of the words I use to them or, even worse, behind their backs, 
Does my conscience approve what I'm saying about them to other people? Is it in harmony with God's unfailing truth? Those are important questions. Well, <clears throat> apostolic doctrine is essential to good conscience and therefore to Christian living. A good conscience is tied to good doctrine. Say it again. A good conscience is tied to good doctrine. 1 Timothy 1, 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Paul wants Timothy to live by faith in Christ with a good conscience. He wants him to minister with a good conscience. Which means that his conscience is at peace and it approves his actions because it is loaded with apostolic doctrine. His behavior, and by the way, same for us, our behavior should correspond to apostolic doctrine. Those that forsake their good conscience, as the false teachers did, shipwreck their faith. Apostolic doctrine and holy living are essential, essential to a good conscience. First Timothy 3, 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, <clears throat> it's important as you read through the scriptures to realize, especially in the New Testament, that when we see the word faith, it can mean the act of believing or it can mean the body of of doctrine, the content of doctrine that we believe. And that's, we're looking at the content. We're looking at the, the body of doctrine, the body of divinity here when Paul says, holding the mystery of the faith. And once again, remember, mystery, when you see it in the scripture, isn't a mental puzzle, a life puzzle that we can't figure out. That's not the idea. A mystery in the scriptures is a truth, a divine truth that has been hidden but is now manifest. We see it, we hear it, we understand that it is. it, it was something we did not know, for instance, the person and work of Christ. Before the foundation of the world, it was settled. It was going to happen. But it was not known. Except in a, in, with a veil when the Old Testament prophets would speak. But then it came into clear light when Jesus the Lord came. The mystery was over in the sense of being an unknown so the mystery of the faith here is that which has been revealed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the truths that are attendant with it, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. That passage is speaking to deacons. They must serve God's people, affirming and holding the revelation of apostolic doctrine with a moral conscience that approves their ministry. Once again, their conscience must be informed with right doctrine that leads to right living. 1 Timothy 4.2 Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is a dreadful passage. Here Paul describes false 
teachers, they have desensitized their own consciences by their false doctrine and feel no guilt about it. They are in the worst case imaginable for a human being. Their conscience is no longer warning them. You and I can get there. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.3 I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. By the power, my friends, of the Holy Spirit and the washing of Christ's blood, Paul lived with a conscience that approved his ministry, his doctrine, his actions. That's what we should be working for. That's what we should be tuning and calibrating, even recalibrating ourselves for. We want our conscience clear. Every now and then it starts nagging. If it's a, le a legitimate nagging, the last thing you want to do is kill it. You need to work out why it's nagging. Sometimes you know right away. You know why your conscience is bothering you. You know the tone that was in your voice or the look that you gave or the act that you did. You know. But you don't want to acknowledge it. That's the road to destruction. Your conscience is there for a reason. <clears throat> Paul could say, I live, I live with a pure conscience. <clears throat> now, he's not arguing for what we would call perfect today, absolutely spotless. Paul could, stay, could say throughout his ministry things like, I'm the chief of sinners. But he knew and understood the gospel so clearly and applied it so diligently and earnestly to his life that when he failed, when he sinned, he knew exactly what to do, why to do it, how much to do it, so that he could keep his conscience clear. Paul lived with, an, with a conscience that approved his ministry and doctrine. Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Under the pure all things are pure. Talking about believers there. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. There's nothing pure to the lost man even though he may think in terms of purity. Oh look at that little child. So pure. Well, if you, if you leave them to themselves, they will show you how impure they are. Right? I mean, we love them, we hold them, we look at them, and, and we think, oh, how, how beautiful, how glorious, how miraculous that I'm holding this life. It's true. And as soon as they can start talking to you, they'll lie to you. You know, I mean, these are the kind of things that we see. <clears throat> to the pure, whose minds have been changed by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit whose consciences have been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ they can look at things and see them purely but the lost live in a darkness that's always suspicious has to be it says unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure and even their mind and conscience is defiled. It's corrupted. The conscience can be corrupted. That's an important thing to remember. We're the ones that do it. Not someone else. Now, unbelievers do not think rightly. I'm not saying that they don't understand 2 plus 2 equals 4. But when it comes to morality, they do not think 
rightly because their mind is blinded by sin. Therefore, their defiled mind and conscience do not and cannot function as God intended. They cannot function properly. Don't think that's just for lost people. Many of you can think back to the early days of your conversion and the joy that it brought you and the things that filled your heart with praise and thanksgiving to God. And then, oh, one day you found out you could still sin. And if you don't deal with that well, your conscience will hurt. If you don't deal with that well, you can damage the sensitivity that you should have. If you gossip enough, it won't bother you to gossip. And we could go on. That's just one little thing we could do. Well, Hebrews 9, 9, the great difficulty in doing this is I want to preach all of these verses. I can't do that. I'm just trying to give you the, the look at it. Hebrews 9, 9 says, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now, this speaks of the old covenant sacrificial system. <clears throat> it could not completely clear a person's sinned, stained conscience. Therefore, it could not bring them a full or a complete inner peace. That stands in contrast to the new covenant, the New Testament sacrificial system. The person and work of our high priest, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and we'll see more of that in the next verse. So let's go right on to Hebrews 9.14. How much more. Oh, listen to this. This is, this is glorious. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without a spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You can live on that verse. That's, that's, that's good. That's soul food right there. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself. This, this is your salvation set right before you. Who offered himself. Here is his work as priest. Offering up the acceptable sacrifice. Offered himself without spot to God. He was the spotless lamb of God. How much more shall that blood purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Notice, cleansed to do what? Serve. serve. Christ's perfect sacrifice and precious blood Purify and cleanse our believing conscience of all condemnation. No matter how sin-stained and guilt-ridden our consciences have been. Any works by which we sought or seek acceptance with God are dead, ineffective works that fail to cleanse or bring peace to our conscience. And by the way, that's another way you can utterly deform and pervert your conscience is to get in, the, in, to, to get in that, that uh, strain that people get in thinking that if I do this, the Lord will accept me. After a while, you can live in that lie. Oh, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. Oh, and they don't do this. Oh, they don't. Oh, but they do that and I don't do that. Tell you what, what you and I need and what any re regenerate soul wants is a conscience purged of its sin and failures so that we can serve our God with joy 
and praise and thanksgiving. <clears throat> With consciences purged by the blood of Christ, we can serve God. Yeah. Oh, the precious purging work of Christ's blood in our consciences. This is vital. Now, how often, how often? How regularly? I'm not asking you to just come up with a number, but I want you to think. Is this your constant and regular activity? Purging and cleansing your conscience from what you've done today. If not, you'll find out very often that our sins have kind of an accumulative effect. I don't know how to describe it other than that. But they can kind of begin to build. And all of a sudden, they're, they're like a pack of hungry dogs. They're running together in packs. Well, oh, the precious blood of Jesus. How it sweetens the soul. How it cleanses and gives us joy for the day. Bring your failures and immerse them. In the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Once again the references to the old covenant sacrifices. The word conscience in this context may carry the sense of consciousness. As opposed simply to conscience. That means awareness. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Meaning the old. Uh, wh why keep offering these sacrifices? Because the worshipers once purged. If they'd been completely purged. Would have had no more awareness of their sins. But either way. <clears throat> it's the blood of Christ that purges. Otherwise, this means that the blood of Christ, Christ applied to our conscience relieves it. It relieves our conscience from the condemnation of sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So you can have an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now we can draw close to God, we're being told, with a sincere heart. Listen to this, a full assurance. Now that's an issue of the conscience and a lot of Christians struggle with it. Am I in Christ or am I out of Christ? Where does my assurance come from? Well, that's a series of messages in itself. But here's the thing that we can take away with this verse. We can draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith. Faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and, uh, and that means by the blood of Christ, <clears throat> and our bodies washed with pure water. We have undergone that death called baptism and risen again to newness of life in Christ Jesus. Well, more to go. <clears throat> I look forward to getting to Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18 says, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. The apostle asks for prayer. He and those with him have good consciences. Why? Because they are willing to and have been living not just sitting and thinking about doctrine, but living that doctrine. Living, living, living. Willing to live honestly before God and men.
1 Peter 2, 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Peter addresses slaves here. In verse 18, he calls slaves to submit to their masters, whether those masters are good or bad. In verse 19, conscience toward God means conscious of his relation to God. Are you conscious of the relationship you have with God? Or is that something you kind of leave at the door of the church building when you leave on Sunday? Or do you go the next day to take what God has spoken to you and say, now, I've heard from my Lord. Yeah, I mean, I understand messages like this, messages that are longer. Uh, we might not remember every single aspect of them. We're not, we may not even remember the, the headings. I don't sometimes, and I, I write them. But the fact of the matter is, can you come away with something and say, God, God spoke. I heard that, and I know I need to be doing this, or I need to be running from that. Or I know that I need to mortify that as soon as God gives me the grace and the strength to do so. Right? So, what he's saying is that as he speaks to these slaves, he means, he says, you, you, you... If a man for conscience toward God or who is conscious of his relationship with God endures grief, suffering wrongfully, that's a good thing. Now, most of us don't believe that. How many of you say, oh, I'm suffering. This is great. But this is one of those contexts in which it's true. Oh, that boss you're under. Oh, I'm making my life a living hell. Don't talk like that. You don't know anything about hell. The horrors of hell are beyond anything that you can imagine. Now, being around them might be hell-ish. <clears throat> but you're just having a bad time because of your sin or somebody else's sin. Hell will be the punishment of it. When people say, oh, well, you know, hell is just what we experience on earth. They do not know what they're talking about. And that's a dangerous way to think. Well, in verse 19, conscience toward God means, as I said, conscience of, of relationship to God. So if a Christian slave performs his responsibilities because he's aware of his relation to God... And suffers unjustly for it. God will reward him. And that principle goes out to all God's people. All your life. Listen carefully. All your life. You're going to be under flawed authority. Always. There are no perfect presidents. There are no perfect policemen. There are no perfect elders in a church. There's certainly no perfect churches. By the way, <clears throat> there are not any perfect church members either. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, in, in those roles of authority, there's not any perfect parents. Get over it. There's not any perfect parents. I repeat, get over it. Your parents are sinners, and you're a sinner. You have inherited their sinful nature. Do all you can to exalt Christ in your life. So the point is, you're always going to be under faulty authority. You've got to learn how to interact with it. You've got to learn how to interact with it and bring glory to God. And if conscious of your relationship with God, you submit to that, un, uh, that imperfect authority, God blesses that. Well, let's move on. First Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good 
conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or your good behavior in Christ. Well, in brief, Christians should always set apart God as the Lord in their hearts, the governor, the king, and be ready to give an answer, to give a reason for your hope in Christ. All of us are called to be at least on the bottom level apologists for the faith. In other words, it doesn't mean that you've got to have five years of study in the, in the, uh, the discipline of apologetics. That's fine if you want to do that. That's not a bad thing at all. But the fact of the matter is, all of us are called to give the testimony of why we have a hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. All of us. The Lord will put us in those situations too. <clears throat> the world will criticize and slander us. But we should always live so that our conscience approves our conduct. We should always live so that our false accusers will be ashamed of their lies about us. First Peter 3, verse 21, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is an exceptionally difficult passage. I would love to do just a whole message on it so that we would understand the ins and outs. But that's not the focus of what we want to look at. We just want to extract the notion of the conscience that is set here before us. But I'll do my best to put it in uh, a, a context that will be helpful to understand this difficult verse. In verse 20, Peter says that God was patient while Noah built the ark. And in that ark, eight people were brought safely through the water. The water, the flood, was God's judgment upon a sinful world. What did he do? He killed everybody except those in the ark. He killed everybody. Now Peter explains that this this water, this flood, this judgment upon the sinful world corresponds to baptism. The waters of the flood brought the judgment of death. The waters of baptism speak of judgment unto death. Noah and his family rose from the waters of death in the ark. Believers rise from the waters of death in Christ. That's the idea here. If you take the parenthetical uh, matter out of the verse, it says baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not that the water saves you. It's not that the act in and of itself saves you. But in so doing, we are uh, we are speaking to the world that we're dying to what we were. Why are we dying? Because we're sinners. The wages of sin is death. We go under the water. We are dead in union with Christ. And then we're raised up because he was raised from the dead. Baptism is such a beautiful sermon. So... <clears throat> Noah and his family rose from the waters of death as believers rise from the waters of death in Christ. Christ is the ark for all believers. <clears throat> so rising from the waters of baptism means that we have died and risen with Christ. The outward act of water baptism saves us by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ, what he's done, what he's completed for us. 
And that rising from the water points to our rising to newness of life. So the outward act of immersion in water does not save us, but the inward spiritual reality of what Christ has done for us does. That's what baptize, uh, baptism represents. So we die in the flood with Christ, but we rise up in the ark of our Savior. God has cleansed our filthy consciences through the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Well, now having surveyed the New Testament occurrences of conscience, we can move to number three. What then is the conscience? I gave you a brief definition last week. We want to expand our understanding of that this week. Many have attempted to define the word conscience throughout the ages of Christ's church. But I trust that you've seen that just the biblical testimony is remarkable. It is there regularly. The word mortification only shows up twice in the whole New Testament. And it's a vital doctrine. But here we have conscience, 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 conscience. Now, it's vital to understand the immensity of the work of conscience and how important it is to each of us. Paul said to Felix, herein do I exercise myself. He doesn't say, I just try a little harder. Doesn't say that. Well, you know, I'm doing the best I can as a Christian. Well, it's good to, to do as, as well as you can as a Christian. But Paul says something entirely different. I'm standing here on trial and I want you to know in the presence of my enemies and in the presence of you, governor, I live with a good conscience. Not only do I live with a good conscience, it's my work. I work out my conscience. I spend time training my conscience. I give it my best Shot. <clears throat> I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. There's the two tables of the law. That's the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's right here. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm trying to live an all Bible life here. From beginning to end, we have the revelation of our God. I want to walk in what he has commanded. You can't do that if you don't know what it says. You can't do that unless you are saturating your mind with the word of God. Paul chose a Greek word here, which the standard lexicons define simply, and you can live with this, the inward faculty of distinguishing right and wrong. The inward faculty of distinguishing right and wrong. <clears throat> now, a faculty in that sense, children, especially, you should... I try to grasp this. You'll hear the word faculty used a number of ways. We talk about the faculty at school or uh, that kind of thing. But here, faculty means an inward power that is part of our human nature. It's something that comes along with being made in the image of God. It's in us. It's inherent. It's part of what God has made us to be. It is an inward power. An inward ability, if you prefer. <clears throat> now, let's con consider human nature for just a moment. God created human beings as body and soul. We are the part of creation that connects creation with creator. We're that part of creation that also is spiritual. We're a two-world people. If 
you want to put it that way. There is the spiritual about us, and there's the fleshly, the, the bodily, the human part about us. We are body and soul. I've, uh, I've been at several funerals, conducted some here lately. And when we look down and see that body laid out in the coffin, we all know. I don't see the life that I knew in that person. Where's the sparkle in the eyes? Where's that, that joyful or that raucous laugh? Where's that serious-minded person? They're not there. It's just the body. Now, when I say that, I don't mean in any way to be insulting or demeaning. I'm just saying that's, they're not there. The part of them that's the most important is gone. They're either being held in horror or in joy with Christ. Waiting for that moment when there will be a reuniting of the body and the soul. You are going to be body and soul for all eternity. You're not going to be a little wispy Casper the ghost floating around in heaven forever. That's, that's just not the way it is. This is one of the reasons Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians, he says, I'm looking forward to my, my heavenly home, my heavenly tabernacle. He, he wants to be reunited with his body. That's going to happen. So humanity is body and soul. God created it that way, and it will be that way ultimately for all eternity. The human soul has two principal faculties, abilities, powers. <clears throat> and what are they? Understanding and will. Understanding and will. <clears throat> now, the understanding uses reason. <laughs> there are some of us that seem to give evidence that we don't have that part. All right? But there is in all of us the ability to reason at least a little bit. All right? Some just reason poorly all the time. But you can reason. You can think. All right. The human soul has that ability. Reason is the human ability to think, understand, and form judgments. You need to get this because it's all connected to the notion of your conscience. <clears throat> Will and understanding go together. Will is that power to act. You act based on your reasoning, thinking, understanding, thinking, and logically working through something, or maybe even illogically, but that's how you get to where I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. Right. When we consider the Holy Spirit's use of the word conscience in Scripture, we may define it this way. The ability of our understanding the ability of our understanding by which we are internally aware of what we believe is right or wrong. Okay, let me say that again. Let that sink in. That's, there's a good thing to talk about at lunch. <clears throat> Parents, ask your children, what's that definition of conscience? It's the ability of our understanding by which we are internally aware, we're aware of what we believe is right and wrong, or right or wrong. Now, if I don't make it to the end of the sermon, you need to know <clears throat> that this is vital because if your conscience is ill-informed, right. It will not discern properly what is right and wrong. You believe what you think is right and wrong. And that's one of the reasons there are Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, and all the rest. 
Our consciences are being informed by something and we are reasoning. We're thinking about it. Sometimes it's just I've been brought up in it like a, a Muslim or a Buddhist, Buddhist or a Baptist church. And I just happen to have heard all of that stuff all of my life. And so that's what goes on in my brain. But the conscience needs to be activated by the power of the Holy Spirit and informed by the truth of God or you will not Make the right decisions. You will say certain things are right and they're wrong. You will say some things are wrong. We can't do that. And you're wrong. The Bible doesn't say you can do that. Uh, sometimes it does. You know, uh, and this is where the, the ideas of tradition have to be scrupulously examined by the word of God. So, it's the ability of our understanding by which we are internally aware, we know inside, of what we believe is right and wrong. <clears throat> that fits well with Martin Luther's definition. Quote, For the conscience is not the power of acting, but the power of judging, which judges about works. Its proper work, as Paul says in Romans 2, is to accuse or to excuse, to cause one to stand accused or absolved, terrified or secure. Why couldn't Luther rest? Because his conscience kept saying, you're a sinner. God has damned you. You have no hope. Oh, you had that terrible thought. Oh, you had that terrible thought. Oh, you said that terrible word. Oh, you did that terrible thing. Day in, day out, day in, day out. And he was ready to have it all over. And then the gospel came home. And he realized it was all in the work of Christ. He worked harder and he did everything Rome told him to do. He labored. If anybody could have worked his way into heaven, we, we could say Luther would be a great candidate. But he couldn't. And there won't be any here either. You're not going to work your way into heaven. But his conscience was told, if you do this, well, you won't be in uh, uh, hell for as long. Or you, you, won't, you won't be in, in the, the, the various things that Rome teaches you about. Right? His conscience was ill-informed. And it was killing him. He would fast himself until he was virtually out of his mind sometimes. Conscience can do that to you. That's why psychologists and psychiatrists make loads of money. Because yeah. people don't know how to deal with their consciences. Many people in churches sit Sunday after Sunday just not knowing what to do. Just tell me what I can listen to. Tell me what I can watch. Please tell me what I can wear. And then I can do all that and be sure I have a good conscience before God. No! You need to figure out what's right and wrong. It's in the scriptures. And that is one of the reasons for the teaching ministry of the church. We, why, why are teachers, why are elders uh, going to have a, a more severe judgment in the day of judgment? Because they're going to be speaking to people's consciences every time they teach and preach. And they're either telling them what's right or they're telling them what's wrong. And if it's not in harmony with what God has said, we've got some things to answer for. Now we'll talk about that more. So, <clears throat> Luther finishes that comment, by the way, by saying its purpose, conscience's purpose, is not to do, but to speak about what has been done and what should be done. And this judgment makes us stand accused or saved before God. Now, this is incredible insight. It's really good. Its purpose is not to do. The conscience doesn't do. The conscience judges. It speaks. That was wrong. That was right. All right? And if it's not properly, properly informed, you will be living in a miserable life. Yep. 
Likewise, our, our little definition fits Calvin's understanding. Calvin said, For just as when through the mind and understanding men grasp a knowledge of things, and from this are said to know, all right, they, they know, this is the source of the word knowledge. So also when they have a sense of divine judgment as a witness joined to them, which does not allow them to hide their sins from being accused before the judge's tribunal, this sense is called conscience. Close quote. Last couple of things will be done. Furthermore, the English word is made up of two parts. This is the English. Conscience. Conscience. Con means with. Shunts or science, since it means knowledge. So the, the idea is knowledge with or shared knowledge. Hmm. Who do we share that knowledge with? The living God. The living God. It's a knowledge of yourself, but it's also the voice of God. Not perfectly. But it is something that God put in you because it's an inner navigator, an inner director. It's the person driving the wagon. The idea is shared knowledge. It is a knowledge shared with the Almighty, the All-Knowing. Now, this was William's, uh, William Ames' understanding. William Ames was was a, a great Puritan theologian. He says, quote, the, the conscience of man, for I do not intend to treat of the conscience of angels, is a man's judgment of himself according to the judgment of God of him. In other words, it's a reflection that goes on. It's a self-judging, but that is connected to God. That's why when it's condemning you, you cannot seem to escape it. And that's why when it's encouraging you, <laughs> you want it to be for the right reason. It's got to be by the truth. The Puritan Richard Sibbs wrote, For what is conscience but the soul itself reflecting upon itself? Did I? You've done this. You know this. Hmm. Should I have said that? Why do you think that? Mm. Something go off in your conscience? Mm. Am I talking about somebody the right way? Maybe I shouldn't have said that to these people. Hmm. We've had five months of that. We should have some tender consciences where we, it appears we have some very hard ones. The conscience is vital. You will not function as a Christian as you should unless you're reflecting upon yourself according to God's truth, not your own judgment. Sibs finishes, it is the property of the reasonable soul and the excellency of it that it can return upon itself. It was made by God. We live with it. It speaks to us all day, every day. And we can be running it right into the ground and making it dull and dead and insensitive. We want that thing to be sharp. No, but then I have to think. <laughs> That's right. You can't just bounce off of life with the way you feel. I don't see anything wrong with that. I never thought anything that was wrong about that. That preacher can't tell me what to do. That's right, he can't. But he can sure tell you what God says. And you better make sure that you've heard what God says. You might just be hearing the preacher. So, how important is what we're talking about? It is essential. You can't live the Christian life without a good conscience. And if you're not living as you should, it's most likely that you have anesthetized your conscience. A little gossip here, a little lie there, 
a little sneaking around behind the back of mom and dad here and there. And after a while, you can do it without one twinge of conscience. You can do it in church. So brethren, this is vital. Absolutely vital. Our consciences are indeed God's spy and God's judge in our hearts. So I close with this. Does our conscience bear witness that we know and believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God come in the flesh? Yes. Does your conscience stand and say, yes, that's the truth, and I believe it. And when I sin, I look to him. I cleanse my conscience in that precious blood. Do, does our conscience believe that he kept the law in our place? Or are you trying to get right with God by, oh, I'll read my Bible a few more minutes. I'll, I'll go to church a little more faithfully. I'll do this and that. Oh, you're gambling with your soul. You may be utterly lost if you're thinking anything remarkably like that. A Christian runs to Christ when he sins. Period. It is that blood that cleanses the conscience so we can get up the next day and serve him again. Yeah. And do we really believe that he kept the law in our place and that we can't do anything to ingratiate God toward us? If you don't get justification, if you don't understand apostolic doctrine, you are not thinking biblically. And you will not reason in a way that will bring glory and honor to Christ. Do you believe that he died in your place? Do you believe that he rose again in your place, our place? Is that where you find hope? Is that what your heart and mind feed on? Or is that, oh, well, you know, that's some of that religion stuff. I'll do a little studying once in a while when it's comfortable. I've got all this life to live and enjoy. Brethren, your conscience and mine needs help. Does your conscience say that you are in Christ or out of Christ? If it's not well informed by apostolic doctrine, you may think you're in when you're on your way to hell. And there's some of you sitting here that that's true of. And on the other hand, you may think, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost when you're one of God's children. Oh, may the voice of our inner judge declare peace. To your soul because of faith in the crucified and risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Father, now thank you for your goodness to us. We've looked at much of your word. Father, no doubt our minds can't hold it all in. But Lord, are there rays of light? Are there shafts of light that are, that are penetrating down into the nooks and crannies of our heart? so that we can see the truth, understand the truth, believe the truth, and begin to reason from truth. Help us to do that. Help us that we might be faithful Christians that love thee and love one another. Bring healing to the souls of this church. Bring life to the lost in this church. Bring edification and encouragement to all and every regenerate soul. We pray it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, brethren,